one of the reasons I tell you at the start of this lecture, at the start of this course, sorry, not lecture, one of the reasons I tell you to watch my basic skills course free on YouTube is to understand the various practical aspects I conveyed in that basics course, such as, for instance, the way I would jab away from a violent person, as opposed to pretending to be Mike Tyson, getting an uppercut, getting a right hook or anything like that. Now, this is a professional lecture. That's not to say that basics course is not professional, not professional grade in terms of basic skills. It's just to say this course is professional, professional grade. And we're going for the university style lectures and all this. Again, that doesn't take away anything from that basic skills. And anything I did there, that may seem contrary. There'll always be a way to harmonize that. And that's whether I have explained that in this course or not. So there's nothing to be taken away from that. That basic skills course is definitely basic skills. A bit like when you did your basic skills test in year five and then went on to year seven and then did your, HS, uh, did your year 10 certificate, which was like a precursor to the HSC, and then did your year 11 subjects and did your year 12. This is year 12. This is the professional grade. So you've gone from basics, skipped year sevens to 10 and all that, and bang, straight to the real thing. Uh, and this is one of your HSC subjects, sheltering urban survival. But I'm not going to make you do any essays. Fuck that. <laughs> so let's get right into it. Even though in my basic skills course, I teach you about jabbing, I cannot stress it enough. You are trying in every shape, way and form to stay away from the need to be violent. Violence is the very, very last thing you want to do in an urban survival situation. And you want to stay away from it as much as practically possible. Your strategy for survival must be to avoid violence as much as possible. I'm not going to go as far as saying at all costs, but as far as practically possible. There are some instances where you will have no choice but to say, it's on, and it's on only because that person is being violent. And that's when you be self-defensive. Not beforehand. It is an absolute contradiction to survival itself to engage in anti-survival behavior. The moment you start using a firearm, the moment you start stabbing, the moment you start hitting, the moment you try to overarch another person, you become the opposite of a survivor. Don't get me wrong. It doesn't make you less of a man. It doesn't make you less of a survivor. You've just got to know where the line is drawn. Because that's it's when that line is drawn, when the real men or real survivors, a lot of women out there are much more ballsy than men, trust me. It's when that line is drawn and when you're faced with no choice that that real aspect comes out as to who really is the braver and more audacious person. And that's when it's permissible for you to be self-defensive, when you've got no other choice. But up until that point, you want to make it as much as humanly possible. You want to make... How do I put it? You want to make it as if there is no other choice. Uh, sorry, you want to make it as if violence is never a choice and you keep pushing that away. It's like, have you ever done Kung Fu and you keep pushing things away? You keep pushing the attack away. You're pushing the prospect of a violent confrontation away with all your strategies. That's why you always have effective evacuation strategies. That's why you behave the way you do. That's why you route plan. That's why up until now, you do all the things I've told you to do. You're avoiding anti-survival prospects, anti-survival behavior. That's why you've got a Faraday cage on your phone. That's why you don't do things that are detrimental 
to your survival, your team's survival. That's why you use your brain. That's what this is all about. You ensure that violence is the very, very, very last thing that could go down. And again, if if it just so happens to occur, and in whatever scope or means it happens, it could be a, one a violent offender, it could be three people shooting at you, it could be a foreign incursion where bombs are dropping, with whatever cards you're dealt, there'll always be a way to defend yourself and for you to be ready, which we'll get into. And for many of these things, for the I'll, I'll state this from now, for the things that you will have to have a proportionate, a potential proportionate response, highlight that, a potential proportionate, proportionate response, for all those things that you will do in terms of what realistically may need to be defended against, proportionate to what you can see in front of you, is a foreign incursion here? Is it going to be a nuclear attack? Is it going to be this? Is it going to be that? In your initial urban survival protocols, your experience, the start, or I should, what I should say is once you get your urban survival going, then once it's stable, remember those projects we were talking about? The things you can do that are realistic? That's when you can start saying, okay, it's not just the stove we're going to put together. It's not just this bed I'm going to quickly whack together. It's not just this fucking car I'm going to make unstealable. It's now being reasonably... Uh, not vigilant, but prepared. This is this is okay preparedness. Not the nut job pre prepared preparers who think that everything is about keeping a stock of cans in the fucking cellar. Oh, for fuck's sake. This is where it's okay to be reasonably prepared. There's nothing wrong with preparation. Preparation is good, so long as it's done realistically and proportionately. Realistically and proportionately. I want you to highlight those terms. And... That's when you can say, yeah, shit, this is a foreign incursion. This is what's going to happen. These are the self-defense items we may need. And as we enter that, does that take away anything from what I've said about firearms and everything thus far? Absolutely not. It's proportionate to what can be expected. And we'll get to that. Uh, and again, I also should note that the start of your survival may not be actually what you think it would be. That you remember we spoke about that yep, that right at the very start, almost uh, when you understand. Yes, this is a survival situation, the most important part of your survival. Well, that doesn't necessarily have to be you being on the street. It could be when you turn on the news and you see. 500,000 soldiers landing in Darwin and going, oh, mother of Christ. That's when the survival situation starts, proportionate to that urban survival situation. Are you getting me? So that's when you go, yeah, shit, this is what turns on. But you've already got your abode. To some extent, it's transitionary. I want you to highlight that. To some extent, that experience is transitionary. Back in Sydney... Everything is business as usual, even all the parts of Queensland, pretty much. Society's up, trains are running, nothing's changed. But there's 500,000 soldiers up there. So at the same time, it is an urban survival situation. But this is how I'm going to approach it, because everything's still up, this is occurring, etc. So be careful with how you activate your urban survival situation. Now let's go back to the violence thing, so let's not go too far off. With violence, again, never, ever is it a part of your urban strategy to cultivate violence, to be heroic, to look for it, to test your metal or anything like that. You can do all that, testing your metal and being heroic or whatnot, when you only need to, when that line is crossed and you have no choice but to defend yourself or the people with you.